Good morning. I'm Mary, and this is Lifestyle Tucson, a program where I speak with nonprofit groups and organizations, finding out how they serve our community and getting updates on current projects. For the first portion of today's show, I am sharing my recent conversation with Lisa Chastain, the CEO of Gospel Rescue Mission. Well, Gospel Rescue Mission, as we've spoken before several times, it has a very long history here in uh, our community. So I'd really like to share a bit of that story with listeners in case they're unfamiliar with uh, oh, just awesome. how long Thank you've you. been around. Yeah, so we will actually be celebrating our 70th year anniversary next year. So we're planning what to do for the celebration. But my grandfather, Ray Chastain, actually started Gospel Rescue Mission back in 1953. So it's an honor for me every day to carry on the good work that he started. So he was a yard master at Southern Pacific Railroad and watched, you know, the hobos, as they called them back in those days, ride the rails. And he was compassionate about it, started bringing food and, and clothing from home. And that became all too often to where he felt like really it was calling. And he left the, uh, the railroad to start the mission. It was in several places downtown. One location was where Tucson Convention Center is, so it no longer even exists. And then in 1956, they built the property in South Tucson, and we remained there all up until we moved to the Center of Opportunity in 2019. So over those uh, 69 years, the phase of homelessness has certainly changed Mm -hmm. over the decades. We continue to just assess what the needs are in the community and try to reach uh, meet the needs. Mm-hmm. Can you give a little insight into what homelessness looks like in our community? Who do you see and what are some of the mm-hmm. numbers that you know of? Yeah, uh, 80% of the people that we serve are due to drug or alcohol addiction and mental health and sometimes all of the above. And um, there are those outliers, you know, that 20% that are homeless because of, you know, priced out rent or eviction or, um, you know, some other situations, divorce, um, economy. Mm -hmm. But the bulk of the people that we serve are there because of addiction and uh, mental health. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what we gear our program around. We help anybody who comes to us, but we certainly see a high number of those that are struggling with addiction Mm -hmm. and mental health. And so I'd like to talk about the Center of Opportunity for a minute. As you said, you opened up in 2019, so this definitely Mm -hmm. has been a bit of an interesting uh, first few years for the Center of Opportunity. (laughs) But tell me a bit about how its development has been and kind of the vision you see for it moving forward and what you want it to become. Yeah, so we started the Center of Opportunity. Um, Just to update your listeners, uh, it's the old Holiday Inn Holodome on South Palo Verde. Perfect property for us. Uh, We often say, I wonder if they knew in the 80s that they were building this for us Mm -hmm. because the space is perfect. So we opened it up with the existing hotel structure. The plan was always to expand. And uh, since then, we've built uh, six new buildings on the property to expand the services and beautify the campus. The goal was always to bring people in from off the streets, have the services and programs that they need uh, to live a life that's successful all under one roof. Mm -hmm. Pretty lofty goal, but we did open up in 2019 with 30 different uh, social service agency providers in addition to us. It was amazing. You know, we all kind of scrunched together because we were all in a small space and uh, just saw people transform. You know, I'll say it again that, you know, in Tucson, it's hard for us that have working vehicles to get from point A to point B. But imagine yourself, you know, on foot or on bicycle or on public transportation. You're there for help at some social service agency. And they say, oh, we can't help you here. You have to go to the east side location. Uh, Nine times out of ten, they're not going to get there. Mm -hmm. Really, uh, our goal was to provide all those services so there was no excuses And we could expedite, really, the Mm -hmm. process for them from homeless to wholeness. Fast forwarding to uh, 2022, even with two years of COVID in the midst of it, that it's uh, it's working so well. We actually have 49 different different partners now that provide services there at the center. And um, like I said, we have six new buildings. We have a full 6,000-square-foot medical and dental clinic that's operated by El Rio. 
Um, we have a job training center that we just partnered together with Pima Community College to bring uh, trade jobs for higher paying jobs, which is amazing. Uh, we have a full workout facility, wellness center, library, office space for all the providers, a beautiful courtyard. Um, so if you haven't seen it, please come visit. We do tours twice a week, and um, we'd love you to come see what transformation looks like. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about the intake process at Gospel Rescue Mission. Because I understand that you also will help people. They, they need to be sober upon coming to Center of Opportunity. But tell me a bit about that intake process. Not necessarily. We okay. get people all the time that are, you know, under the influence. We'll send them to detox, okay. but we'll hold a bed for them. Mm. Um, so... So come as you are, you okay. know, and we'll get you to detox, actually. And uh, they usually are in detox for about 48 hours, and then they come right back to us, and we handle the transportation. Either the detox agency or us will actually provide transportation to make sure that they get back to us. Mm -hmm. Then they're processed through. So we do intake Monday through Thursday. And, you know, we do – it's all a, a bunch of assessments, Right. So we assess their needs, and um, they're given a psych eval, and, you know, they do a lot of, the first week they're there, they do a lot of assessments. They meet with a, a lot of our case managers, and the great thing about um, what we do is everybody that walks in the door is individually case managed. We're people, so there's not a one-size-fits-all formula that works. We work to find the best plan that meets their goals. And what I mean by that is we partner together with them because if it's not their decision to make change and make goals, uh, then they would just be doing it for us and not for them. We work hard to get a best plan that meets their goals and journey with them on that, uh, walk with them on that journey. So um, tell me a bit about who runs Gospel Rescue Mission. I, I assume you have a, a large team of volunteers that... Do a lot of we your, do. Yeah. Yeah. We have a great staff that's in place, but um, no way could we get done everything we need to get done without volunteers. When we're full, we need about 300 volunteers a week, which is a huge task. But let me tell you, the community is just so incredibly generous. And, um, you know, po this post COVID era, we're feeling completely back to normal. And um, we have all of our, uh, most of our volunteers back. It's just a joy to see one of the areas where you see all volunteers is serving the meals. Mm -hmm. So we have a dining room that all the meals are served. And um, I love going in there and just seeing they're all like ants, you know, in there yeah. just serving meals. <laughs> and the best thing about it is they spend time with the people. And they'll, you know, pull up a chair next to them and, you know, how's it going today, Bob? And tell me about how that went for you. And you know, everything that we do is built around, built around relationships because we understand that people come to us and they're, you know, they're hardened. They trust nobody. And um, so we want to uh, build a relationship with them so they trust us so that we can get them the help that they need. I, I'm glad you brought up the, the meal service because one of your biggest events is on the horizon, the Thanksgiving Blessings to Go. And is this the first year it's returned to its normal setting that it was before? Well, or? COVID kind of changed yeah. it. You know, we had to reimagine things and now we're thinking, okay, this is kind of, um, this is kind of working for us. So this year we're doing, instead of just a drive through we're doing a hybrid mm -hmm. event. That means there's come sit at our table and dine with us opportunities as well as drive through We can serve so many more people that way. But also, we certainly want people to take the time and come and sit. There's going to be entertainment and fun for the kids and fun for the family. And um, so the Thanksgiving Blessings to Go is what we're still calling it. November 23rd, it's always the day before Thanksgiving, and uh, from 11 to 2. So if you're in need, please come if you would like to help us. Uh, we need an army of volunteers, and you can get that information at the website. Yeah, I did see that you have a, just like a link right there on your site um, for volunteer opportunities with Thanksgiving blessings. Will you just share with me a little bit more about the history of this event itself? How long have you been hosting these Thanksgiving? Oh my gosh, this is the 34th oh, year. Wow. So Gospel Rescue Mission has a long-standing history with the street banquets, they used to be called. And um, when we were in South Tucson, we'd close off the whole street 
and serve meals on on Thanksgiving. So there's a rich history of that, and it's really great because the social service providers kind that all serve Thanksgiving, we kind of coordinate with each other Mm -hmm. to make sure there's not duplication of uh, meals on certain days. And so we're kind of grandfathered in that day before Thanksgiving uh, so that there's always food, you know, that whole week for anybody who Mm -hmm. needs it. Yeah, and I would like to just kind of touch on that because, you know, the face of homelessness has changed a lot. And we're in a kind of a a sad situation right now where there are people who are struggling who weren't necessarily before. And so this event is really open to anyone. Right. And we are experiencing people that are coming for resources and coming for food boxes and just due to the economy, you know, I go to the grocery store and I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, it's hard. It's hard to make ends meet, you know, so we try to be a resource and a help to those that are, you know, living paycheck to paycheck or they're on the brink of homelessness. We'd rather you come to us and let us, um, you know, supplement some of your basic needs rather than um, you uh, losing your home. Mm -hmm. But we recognize that it's a difficult time for everybody, and um, that's why we're, we're preparing for possibly as many meals as we've ever done. Um, because it is open to anybody who just needs the needs the help right now. Mm-hmm. So I would like to hear a bit more about what type of resources do you have available to help people who are on that brink of uh, losing their home and being in a very difficult situation? So food boxes, mm-hmm. and we do hygiene items okay. and diapers if we have them for the kids, formula for the kids, uh, clothing we have there. We have uh, household goods. Uh, furniture, you know, that's all available. As the community, you know, blesses us with their in-kind contributions, we in turn give it right back out Mm -hmm. to the community, you know, no strings, uh, no thrift store, uh, absolutely free. So if we have it, we're giving it out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what are some things that are kind of on the horizon for Gospel Rescue Mission? Is there any big projects you're working on? Or well, yeah, we have two that? in the works right now. Okay. I think I've even told on this show maybe before because it was a dream, and now we've actually broke ground. Um, we partnered together with Catholic Community Services that's building a medical respite mm-hmm. facility. So medical respite is that place where if somebody is homeless, they're in the hospital, but they get released and they still need some medical care before they get into shelter, um, that that's medical respite. So a 50-bed facility, um, it's going to be a beautiful 15,000-square-foot building. And also the dog shelter services, finally, (laughs) after three and a half years, we've been trying to uh, find the right partner and get this built. So that's actually underway, too. So we're very excited about that, very excited to be able to serve those that are experiencing homelessness that have, you know, a pet with them, have a dog with them that could be, you know, their only companion that we're not, uh, that we don't have to separate them Mm -hmm. now. They have a place for them to live both on the same campus. So those are in the works right now. And you never know. I mean, there's so much need. Mm -hmm. Again, we just always are assessing what we can do. You know, how are, how can we reach people that would never darken our doors You know, we know there's some people out there that are homeless that um, maybe for one reason or the other would never go into shelter. So we're exploring options for that, what that looks like, and how we can reach the unreached. Well, before we start closing off today, uh, tell me about how people can make an in-kind donation or donations there time, their money to help you in your mission. Yeah, so you can help us monetarily, uh, like you said, with your time and your talents, or obviously with your in-kind contributions. You can go to the website, grmtucson.com. You can bring your goods to 4550 South Palo Verde, or if you have a lot, call us and we'll be glad to do a pickup. Um, You know, it really is just the community that makes this work. Mm -hmm. We're Gospel Rescue Mission is 100% privately funded. We don't take government money. It allows us the flexibility and the efficiency to do things uh, a little bit better, um, as well as we don't want to jeopardize our religious freedoms. And so it really is the generosity of the community that makes this all possible. Mm -hmm. And as a uh, a 501c3, uh, you are a qualifying charitable donation? We are, yes. So uh, year-end is coming Mm -hmm. up, and 
we still have the Arizona uh, state charitable tax, you know, dollar for dollar. Um, you're giving it to the government or you're giving it to one of your favorite nonprofits. Please check that out. We are a qualified and charitable organization, and you can get all that information on the website as well. Well, what would you like to close with? What do you really want people to take away from our conversation today? Yeah, I would just um, like to know, everybody knows that, you know, we're seeing homelessness more than we ever have, mm-hmm. right? We see it on the streets. We see it in the medians. We see it through panhandling. Spread the word. You know, we are there to help those individuals. If you need help with putting a care package together, and uh, we have what we call invitation cards that list all of our services and where we're located, uh, that so many people put care packages together and drop those cards in there for resources rather than giving cash. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can help you with that. Don't give up hope. You know, we're out there as many, you know, many other great nonprofits as well, trying to make a difference in the lives of those that are experiencing homelessness and really getting to the root issues. That's what we do. How are they never going to go back to the streets? Well, let's look at what caused them to get on the streets in the first place and really meet the needs of those obstacles so that they can live successful lives. So don't be discouraged. Uh, We're out there uh, beating the streets, if you will, and trying to get people off the streets Mm -hmm. and uh, providing hope to those that are struggling. Wonderful, Lisa. Well, before we close off, just a reminder for everyone when Thanksgiving celebrations are. Yes, Thanksgiving Blessings to Go is November 23rd from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. If you need help or if you would like to help, you can go to the website, uh, grmtucson.com. Click on the Volunteer tab, and you'll see Blessings to Go. Wonderful. And just to confirm, that's going to be located at the Center of At the Center of Opportunity. Thank you. 4550 South Palo Verde Road. Awesome. Well, Lisa Chastain, I really appreciate you taking this time to get us updated and to share the word of what you've been doing with us. Thanks, Mary. That was Lisa Chastain, the CEO of Gospel Rescue Mission. For more information on Gospel Rescue Mission, how to find resources or help out, go to grmtucson.com. I'm Mary, and you are listening to Lifestyle Tucson. For the next portion of today's show, I am sharing a recent conversation I had on Zoom with El Grupo. I am speaking with Ignacio Rivera de Rosales, uh, and I am the co-founder and currently uh, the coordinator of senior programs and the head coach of the team. As a co-founder, tell me a bit about the history of El Grupo. How long have you been around, and what's the vision for your organization? Grupo is very much, a, it's a youth empowerment organization. And so really what it comes down to is we just use the bicycle to teach kids how amazing they are uh, and to teach kids how they can be wonderful contributors to society and the world around them. We just happen to use the bicycle to do it. It started uh, roughly 2006 uh, when I moved to Tucson, Arizona. I came uh, to Tucson because of the U of A. There was a master's program that I was really interested in and in the School of Education. It was bilingual education. So I came here already pretty passionate about bikes, but really not knowing much about bikes at all. And so really wanted to immerse myself in that. I was working at a local bike shop and a uh, a principal of a not yet formed charter school came in uh, and we started chatting and I started asking how I could get involved. And she asked if I could lead a fitness elective at her school. Uh, So I naturally thought, great, I'd love to teach, you know, go on bike rides with kids. I'd grown up as an athlete myself, and and athletics were certainly a central part of my childhood and giving me uh, direction and discipline and allowed me like a a place to dream, you know, and to set goals. So uh, when I started riding with these kids, you know, when you move to Tucson, you hear about the Tour de Tucson, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a really big deal. Well, when I started riding with these kids in August, they were absolutely never going to get ready for any distance of the November L Tour. And that was okay, but I still wanted a goal. I still wanted them to have to like challenge themselves to physically achieve a goal. All those years ago, there was another event in the spring and it was called the Tour of the Tucson Mountains. And I got this classroom of kids ready to ride 27 miles. I probably took us upwards of four hours, which is like less than 10 miles an hour, you know, while riding. But it was like the greatest physical achievement for all of these kids. Uh, And that was really the inspiration for me was watching this classroom full of kids do something physically that they never thought was possible when they started. And that was really the inspiration point where I was like, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to teach kids how amazing they can be and how they can break down all of these self-imposed barriers. 
So it really started to steamroll from there. And, you know, two years later, I go in front of my class, you know, you, 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 you have a class and you, you know, from the school, you get your roster and there's 15 names on it. And so day one, you're like introducing yourself to your students and I'm counting on my list. And I'm like, there are more kids here than are on my list. Like, where are you from? And I had kids from different high schools showing up to ride bikes. It was at that moment that I was like, holy smokes, this is something bigger. This is something different. Uh, and what do we do? Lucky enough, at that point, uh, my brilliant girlfriend, who's now my amazing wife, uh, was also inspired by it. Uh, and so we decided to create our own nonprofit to try to continue to do the same. So it started on up my back porch. Basically, it went from the school to my back porch because to have all these other kids coming, we needed somewhere to meet. So I was like, great, we can meet in the backyard. And I started to build bikes out of whatever I could find, uh, basically buying whatever used parts and bikes I could find. The kids would help me build them up. And then my wife at the time got pregnant. Uh, and she was like, get everything off the back porch. And I was like, absolutely. Uh, but she, was, in a, she uh, was the executive director for 15 years and was incredibly good at building the program, finding funds and resources and all of that. Uh, so we moved into our first clubhouse. And that was this really critical moment because what it gave kids is this place to be that wasn't school, that wasn't home, that wasn't uh, a business or anything of the sort, but it was their place. And, and that's really been this like critical element of the team that's really been quite different than I think a lot of organizations, much in the way that you hear about the importance of like the boys and girls club house, like the boys and girls clubs clubhouses, right? It's where kids go to just hang out after school uh, and to see their friends in that, in that very social way. In about 2009, we moved into our first place and that was a really exciting move. And really from there, we were able to sort of collect more bikes and to collect more resources. And then as we got more resources, we were able to invite more kids. Um, and then we were able to have like girls only tryouts and really try to, you know, expand out. So here we are, you know, 15, 16, 17 years later, my goodness, we're a rocking program. We've got uh, four different programs that we run right now. So what are your programs? We've got uh, the team, which is the most visible at times because they're kind of the older kids kind of out riding and that are sort of more present amongst the community. We've got 30 kids doing that. But we realize that not every kid wants or needs competition or that's the healthiest way for them to self-express or for them to self-challenge. Uh, so we created a bike packing program. And those kids, rather than finding competition as their challenge, they take on these really cool uh, weekend trips where they put everything they need to eat and camp on their bikes. And they kind of find these really cool routes and go off into the desert with their friends and they camp for the night or two nights and ride back. So it's still wonderful physical challenge. Um, they still have to you know, uh, 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 train to be able to do these routes, but it's a non-competitive way for them to learn about themselves. 15 kids there. And then we've got our Grupito program, which is phenomenal. We've got 50 kids in there. And that's really that entry level, elementary, younger, middle school. Hey, I want to ride. And so it's your foundational skills, foundational mountain bike skills. And we've got incredible leaders there. And then we realized that uh, we're really close to the west side of Tucson, uh, neighborhoods like, like Hollywood and Menlo Park. And a lot of those kids, for whatever reason, they can't get to us. Uh, but we really wanted to engage those kids because they're our neighbors and, and we want, you know, we want our neighbors riding bikes too. So many years ago, I did some programming at, uh, at Manzo Elementary um, and they've got a wonderful principal there. We recognize that, oh, these kids, for whatever reason, they can't come to us after school. So we're going to bring programming to them. So we got a whole fleet of bikes, brought them over there. Uh, and now we've got programming there five days a week after school. So that's pretty exciting. So we've got pretty robust programming with 150 kids now. Yeah. So what's the youngest you typically will take into the group? In sort of weekly programming and all the time programming, right around third grade. So that's like seven, eight years old. And then we also have to recognize that not every eight-year-old is at the same place maturity-wise, right? There are some eight-year-olds who are fully ready, and there are some 12-year-olds who you're like, they're not quite ready yet just because every kid develops, you know, differently. So eight years old is about the start for weekly programming. 
However, in the summer, we have our summer bike camp. Um, and that's really the coming, like the most beautiful coming together of all of our programming because throughout the year, all of the senior programming kids, all my all my teenagers, all the older teenagers, they're learning about themselves. They're learning about how to challenge themselves. They're learning about who they can be. They're learning about their sort of goals and dreams and whatnot. And then in the summertime, they share that passion uh, through our summer bike camp. So they're my counselors. That's really where you, where you have that full circle where they really then learn how to be leaders uh, and they learn how to teach kids everything that they've learned throughout the year. So during summer bike camp, we go as young as six but that definitely is a, a very mature six-year-old. I'd like to hear more about your clubhouse. I remember the last time, uh, or I remember this time last year, that you had the goal of purchasing your clubhouse. How is that developing? Are you still leasing, or is it official? Super exciting. We were able to buy the building. Right. We've signed paperwork. We were able to work with the bank and find a payment structure that worked, and, and off we go. So all of the joys of of home ownership are, are before us. And, uh, and it's a really exciting time actually uh, to be able to own it. And so, so many of the dreams and ideas that we had about how we could build out the clubhouse and just create more opportunities for kids are now things that we can do. Whereas before when you're leasing and you're renting, you know, you can only do so much improvement until the landlord says no. And so now, you know, it's like we have that wonderful blank slate before us. And so, uh, it's really fun working with the current staff right now and kind of hearing all their dreams and desires because I think so there's some exciting things that are going to happen. Earlier, you had mentioned El Tour, which is such a notable event in our community, but El Grupo has its own signature event coming up, the Fall Thundo. What year is this going to be? Uh, this is the 10th one, uh, which is pretty wild to say. I remember the very first one. I remember the very first time that I heard about the idea. Uh, and so to think that we're at the 10th one is, is, is really exciting and I think a testament to um, how well they've gone and, 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 and the fun atmosphere that we've created. So what are the details? The 2022 Fall Fundo is next Sunday, October 30th, and I understand that there are a couple of different distances for riders, even an option for those who don't want to ride. So what's all planned for this year's event? It's all centered around you coming with your friends and having a beautiful day on your bicycle. That's really what it's all about. We want you to have a great time with your friends. We think we've got some really nice routes planned out and we've got some really good food planned out as well. And I think that's really a central feature of it as well. We want you to have a beautiful day on your bike with all of your wonderful friends eating really great food. Uh, and so there's different ways to do it. For our maybe more entry-level riders, riders who are just getting more comfortable riding or just finding cycling, we've got a 35-mile route. It's mostly using uh, the loop bike path the whole way, so folks can feel really confident and secure there. Uh, that's 35 miles um, with one wonderful SAG stop, uh, so you can uh, enjoy some good food there. We've got a 50-mile option as well, which is a little bit more robust, which does use uh, the bike path and then and then and then branches out as well. Uh, and then we've got the longer route, which allows you to eat a little bit more, which is nice. Uh, and that one is 75 miles. We hope that everyone enjoys their bike ride so much and kind of uh, collects back at the clubhouse sometime between 10:30 and 11 when the party starts. Uh, so when you come back again, we're going to do the same thing. We've got a really fun band. Uh, lined up for everybody to enjoy. We've got a live auction with an auctioneer who's going to be joining us. We have a really, some really nice catered food. Uh, Dragoon uh, Brewing Company is going to have some nice beer for us. Um, so we just want to throw a nice party afterwards with really nice people and you can enjoy your friends and meet new friends and just kind of have a wonderful day on your bike. Is there a registration deadline? Some of us are notoriously last minute. Can you register day of or what do you recommend? It would be great if you could sign up at least the day before uh, just to let us kind of plan out uh, things a little bit better. Uh, but if you do need to uh, sign up day of, we might waggle our finger a little bit, but uh, we'd love to have you. The more the merrier. Where should those interested go to get registered? Yeah, you can go right to our website, elgrupocycling.org. Uh, uh, you can find it there. And it's also on Bike Reg. Uh, bikereg.com. So you've got two different ways to, to, to get there. Uh, but certainly we'd love to have people check out the website because there's a lot of information there and hopefully it gets you excited to participate with us in different ways. Well, before we wrap up, what would you really like the community to take away and know about El Grupo? Yeah, I think more than anything, I want 
folks to know that El Grupo is a place for kids to wonderfully learn about themselves. Uh, and it's a place where kids learn how to accept challenges. Once they've accepted that challenge that we do our, our, our very best to make sure that they're wonderfully supported to try to get there. Uh, so we're a challenge-based organization for anybody and everybody. We just so happen to use the bicycle as the vehicle to teach kids how amazing they are. And once again, what's the best way for people to learn more or donate their time or money to helping out El Grupo? ElGrupoYouthCycling.org. That would be great. That was Ignacio Rivera de Rosales, the co-founder and coordinator of senior programs for El Grupo. You've been listening to Lifestyle Tucson, and I am Mary. If you're part of a nonprofit group or organization that would like to be featured in an upcoming episode of the Lifestyle Tucson program, reach out to me by email, publicaffairs at azlotus.com. That is publicaffairs, all one word, at azlotus.com. For more information about the show or to listen back to something you may have missed, go to the Sunday Mornings page at mixfm.com, kfma.com, klpx.com, or espntucson.com.